So we're talking about contour diagrams. Um, I think most people have, have seen contour diagrams before, but the idea between behind a contour diagram uh, is that it allows you to to place three dimensions onto two dimensions and to do it uh, very accurately. So just to kind of get an idea, here here's some uh, some place we're talking about South Hamilton, some town. Pleasant, and what do each of these lines indicate to us? Well, what the what each of those lines tell us, uh, they're giving us, for example, this line right here. It's telling us the altitude everywhere on that line is equal to thirteen hundred. Uh, so let, if we look over here, everywhere on that line is going to have an altitude. Of 1700. So, so the altitude is, is really like the Z value. It's our height. And then we have the X and Y. So even though this is a two dimensional um, two-dimensional picture, it's really in 3D because these contour lines are, give us the, the actual height, the, the Z value. You can't really talk about contour maps, in, uh, especially not in New Hampshire without looking at Mount Washington. Um, but let's, let's kind of think about what, what you can learn from a contour map. So for example, you know, here's one walking path. And let's say that this is another walking path. Which one of these two paths, which are mostly equal in length, would be harder to do? Well, anyone with with uh, a little bit of knowledge of of a Mount Washington and b contour lines, um, if we call this option one and this option two, option one is going to be much harder. Why? Well, because you're intersecting. You're intersecting many more contour lines. So that intersection of contour lines uh, is you getting a much greater elevation gain. So it's much, it is much steeper. Whereas in path two, we're not intersecting nearly as many contour lines. So it's uh, less steep. Okay, so um, in, again, this video is about becoming familiar with and, and, and learning about uh, contour maps, not only in relationship to uh, not only in relationship to elevation, but also in terms of any sort of three-dimensional uh, space that we're talking about. But let's let's continue on with our discussion of elevation, and let's think about what uh, the contour lines. Would represent. So here in this circular uh, concentric circles, we go from 300, let's say meters, to 400 to 500, and then we stop. There's no higher contour lines. So what would this be as we kind of increase our altitude up to some set point? So we're increasing, increasing, increasing. This is a mountain peak. This is what the top of a mountain would look like on a contour map. And then what about this section here? Well. We're getting steeper and steeper and steeper that direction, steeper in this direction. And here we're getting steeper. Here we're getting steeper. And then it kind of levels off here. So what would that be? So again, we're the green line says we're getting steeper and then flattens off, and then it's steeper in this direction, steeper in this direction, and here, you know, we're going downhill. What this would be is a is a pass between two mountains. And lastly, um, here we've got these long lines, which which suggest constant height. So we start off at 200, go to 100, go to 100, and then back up to 200. Uh, so, so what would that really look like? Well, 
Uh, let's see if I could sort of draw it. It's basically a long valley. So imagine sort of like a parabolic container. Well, it's like that, um, where we start off steeper and get lower and then steeper again. So here's a question. We, we often talk about lines intersecting. Why can contour lines never intersect? Take a second to think about this question. Because they can't. Well, contour lines would never intersect because that just wouldn't make any sense. For a contour line to inter intersect, that would mean that we are at two different heights at two different times. So, so that, that will never be the case. So contour lines will, will never intersect. Okay, now let's look at a contour, um, a contour map that isn't in terms of elevation. So here we have uh, a graph that's looking at our corn production in terms of our uh, percent of our current yield. So currently we're at 100% of what we're making because that's what we're measuring in terms of. Uh, if I'm at the 110 section, that means I'm producing more corn. 70% uh, means I'm producing less corn, 70% of my current amount. And what we're looking at this, we're looking at our percent yield in terms of temperature and rainfall. So these are my two variables. So given this, let's interpret F of 18 comma 78. Well, that's saying when um, my rainfall is 18 and my temperature is 78. So if we go from 18 up to 78, what does this equal? Well, that's 100%, which means that at, at those values of rainfall and temperature, I would yield the same amount as I currently do. Well, what about the uh, the next point, 12 comma 76? So if I go up to 12 and then over from 76, I'm falling in between the 80 and the 90. So this means that I'm, you know, my my percent yield is somewhere between 90 percent and 80 percent of what it currently is. So which one of these points would you prefer as a farmer? Well, I'm no farmer, but I would say I would prefer this one because it's producing more corn. Okay, so um, now let's think about the idea of keeping our functions or keeping our variables constant. So what, would it, what are the cross sections with T and R constant through the point representing present conditions? Well, here's my present conditions. So this line is if I held R constant. And this line here is if I held temperature constant. And so what, what this blue line suggests is if you hold temperature, or if you fix temperature, an increase in R, my rainfall, will increase my production until a point. So if I if I increase uh, my rainfall, I go from 100 to 110, then I'm going to go back to 110, and then back to 100. So it will increase my production until about, well, maybe until here. So until R equals 21. And then afterwards, I'll start uh, decreasing my production. What about looking at the red line? So looking at the red line, this is saying that if I increase T, I'll 
holding my rainfall, so keeping R constant. I'm going to go from 100 to 90 to 80 to 70. So I will lose productivity. And similarly, if I if I'm holding my rainfall and I decrease the temperature, I'm also going to I'll increase my productivity for a little bit during here, but then I'll get back to 100% and then I start decreasing it. Okay, so um, what we've done here is we've taken this this contour map from the last example of my corn, and I've I've lifted up the contour map. So I've I've, I've now tried to show an example of making it 3D by you know when it was 110 percent here. I lifted that contour up 110, and where it is you know this 80% line going down to where it was flat. I have now lifted, let's see, lifted it up to be 80 units high. So this is this idea of creating, um, making a contour diagram three-dimensional by lifting each of the contours up to their appropriate height. So from a contour diagram, by lifting the contour lines, you can get a graph of the actual function. Well, how do you how do you get contour diagrams? So let's um, let's think about it. Well, going back to the function that we looked at in the last couple of videos, if I have some function x squared plus y squared, the idea of a contour line, or or also called level curves, is that on those level curves, the z value or the dependent variable is fixed. So we make our function equal some fixed value and we and we change that value of c. And for each value of c, we're going to get a different shape. So for example, uh, when c equals four, we would get x squared plus y squared equals 4. And we know that this is a circle with a radius of 2. And really, for any value of c, we're going to get a circle with radius root c. So what would the... Well, try to draw a contour diagram of the following. Uh, take a second to do this on your own, and once you've done... Um, Press unpause and you can see how well you did. So this is this is our contour diagram, and it's exactly as we would have suspected. Uh, remember that we were taking the function x squared plus y squared equals z, but we were setting this equal to set values, so we're getting a bunch of circles. So, for example, here's when c or z equal 2, and what we get is a radius of root 2. And similarly, uh, here's when it was 4, and as we would expect, we get a radius of 2. And we see that, 1, 2. So, in order to draw... contour lines all you need to do is fix z values and then you'll get a bunch of uh, a bunch of shapes uh, and those z values that you fixed become the contour value whether it's 2 or 4 or 8 So let's think about doing that. Um, take a take a stab at tr at drawing this contour diagram on your own, and I'll I'll give you a hint to get started if you need one. If you don't need a hint, press pause and go. Otherwise, take a little hint and then try it. The hint is this: Let's start off by letting z equal one, and when z equals one, we get the line. Or the, the shape, which ends up being a line, 1 equals 2x 
plus 3y plus 1. Well, solving this for y, we're going to get y equals negative 2 thirds x. So the line y equals negative 2 thirds x is a contour line for when z equals 1. And we, what, we'll, what we recognize is that for any value that we put in for z, we're going to end up with a linear relationship between x and y. So our contour diagram is this linear relationship. And so here are all these different values of um, all these different z values and the corresponding lines that go with them. And here's the one that we just found where z equaled 1. And as we would expect, it goes to the origin because I have no y-intercept. Or my y-intercept, rather, is 0. OK. Um, so we can also think about contour diagrams in terms of a, our tables. So for example, if we if we look at this table and we're looking at z values, what we what we're looking for is, you know, where do we have constant z values? So at the point um, you know, when x is negative five and y is one, or when it sorry, sorry, let me say that again. When x is um, negative 2 and y is 1, we get 3. Or when x is negative 2 and y is negative 1, we get 3. Or when x is 2, y is negative 1. So for, for all of these values, um, for, for the x, y, let me just make this a little clearer. These are the x values, and here are the y values. So for all of these x, y values that correspond to the same z values, they would be on the same contour line. And, and one thing that I mentioned here, and well, we're not ready to really understand this, if we look at the diagonals, we get some really interesting relationships that look at change. So here we're going from 9 to 3, down 6, down 6, down 4, down 4. Down two, down two, down two, down two. Here we go down by zero. We're stuck at zero. Here we're going up by two. And then up by four. And while this is just a cool pattern now, uh, in the near future you'll be able to explain why uh, why we're recognizing or why those why those changes are occurring. Um, but the idea is once you plot all of these different values, you can start mapping out the, the contour map. And the idea being for all of these combinations that are 0, oops, our, so here are my contours that are 0. And like I said um, earlier, there there were a handful of points where I had where where I was at a value of three. So if we look at the point negative two comma one, so negative two comma one, there I am in between four and two at three. Uh, negative one, sorry, negative two, negative one. This point here, also in between four and two, I'm at three. So this, the idea is that we can sort of see, not sort of, we can completely see how these uh, z values are falling into the appropriate contour spaces. So let's just like choose one at random. You know, here's the point 0, comma 2. So 0, comma 2 gets me right there. And I'm falling on the negative 4 contour line. And in fact, my z value is negative 4. So 
just trying to get, get some familiarity and comfort with contour diagrams. But what would this figure look like? Uh, we've actually seen this before. We've got um, constant y values here. And here we're decreasing. Sorry. We're increasing from smaller, negative 4 to negative 2, increasing. Uh, here we're increasing in this direction. So what is this going to look like? This will look like uh, the saddle, which we saw before. So if we think about it, uh, this increase right here can be seen like that. This increase right here is right there. And then we're going, um, then we're dropping off, negative 2, negative 4, negative 6. So that we see that in terms of this falling off right there. And again, here, negative 2, negative 4, negative 6. We see that in terms of falling down there. So take a second, just pause this video, um, and what I what I want you to do is just really kind of begin to see, begin to really kind of connect the three-dimensional picture uh, on a 2D space to our contour map, uh, and, and the goal is to be able to look at the contour map and visualize this, or to see this and be able to visualize the contour map. That's the, that's the uh, eventual hope over the next couple of days. All right, so let's, we're going to finish this video um, thinking about a very important uh, contour diagram, which is called the, the Cobbs-Douglas production function. And we, we want to look at this uh, just because it's a very neat application of contour diagrams. Uh, now, Cobbs and Douglas were, were very important economists uh, in the earlier part of the 19th century. And um, what they were looking at is, is economic production. And they're looking at the number of workers, um, the value of, of equipment that you're using, and production level. And in particular, we're, they're saying, let's let these two be our variables, our independent variables. So as we mess around with the number of workers and the value of the equipment, how is that going to affect the production level? And so the question is, I want you to pause the video and think about which one of these graphs would likely make sense uh, or, or is the Cobb's Douglas production function, uh, which one makes more intuitive sense? So pause this video and try to make a statement. Is it is it graph one or is it graph two? Okay, so you know if we think about it, um, if let let's draw some fixed line here. And the idea there is we're setting the value equal to some, we're fixing the value and looking at the effect of production. So it we were at two and it took us quite a long time to get to three. When we started with uh, zero workers. Well, let's let's go up a little bit more. Here, let's start with zero workers and kind of go across. Now it takes less time. We have a higher value of uh, equipment and it took us less time to increase our production. But the, the key number to look at, I think, to really sort of, uh, well, I guess to discount number one, number one's wrong, uh, is, to, is to look right here. Because in each of these cases, how many workers do I have? Well, in each of those cases, the number of workers equals zero. So does it make sense if you have no workers that you could have uh, some production? Even though, I mean, it makes sense that as our value, it, the value of our uh, equipment increases, the production increases, but it doesn't make sense that for us to have no workers, here we have no workers and yet we're producing. Impossible. This makes much more sense. We've got a vertical asymptote here, which says that if you have no workers, if n equals zero, 
then production equals zero. And similarly, we've got a horizontal asymptote, which says that if I have no equipment, if the value of my equipment is zero, then my production equals zero. In other words, if I have, if the value is zero, means I have no equipment. If I have no equipment, I can't produce. So this curve makes much more sense if you look at those endpoints. Um, so let's let's kind of let's see what these these genius uh, economists and mathematicians developed. They said, okay, let's um, our production is a function of number of workers and value of equipment, uh, and we could describe it as some constant n times or raised to the variable alpha, where alpha must be between zero and one, and v raised to some exponent beta where beta also is between 0 to 1. So then it says show that the contour lines of the function have approximately the shape of the contours in the figure in the last page. So in other words, given this equation here, how can we confirm that it would in fact make a graph that looks like this. Well, remember, the idea of a contour line is to set, let p equal some value. So we're going to set it equal to a constant. And we can say, um, so p naught equals c n to the alpha v to the beta. And what we want to do is get an equation that's in terms of we want to have v be considered our dependent and n our independent. So we'll solve for v. We get v equals p naught over c n to the negative alpha. And then we're going to raise both of those to the 1 over b. And we're raising it to the 1 over b to cancel out that, that beta right there. Okay, so we do that, and, um, and it, maybe it doesn't pop out to you immediately, but I think with a little bit of examination, we'll see that the first part, because we set uh, p equal to p naught, some constant, this is just a constant number. And then we have n raised to the negative something. Well, n raised to a negative value is, this is going to result in exponential decay, which makes sense because my graph looked like an exponential decay graph. And each of these contour lines are for a different value of p naught. Okay, so... Um, we ended with a with a neat application of, of contour lines, but the, the purpose of this is to, to the, this video is to be able to relate contour maps uh, and 3D shapes.